For decades, Watchdog has fought hard to make us safer in our homes and cars. And it's never more important than when we're talking about protecting our kids. That's why we were shocked when we asked a professional for some advice on the best way to fit a child's car seat. And this is how they left it. <laughs> and then it's not moving. Only if it's tiny, but you can't help that. Tonight, Watchdog is back with something every parent needs to know. Hello and welcome to the new series of Watchdog, Fighting for Your Rights, live for the next hour. Are you one of 1.2 million UK drivers affected by the Volkswagen emissions scandal? They've said all the cars will be recalled by the end of 2016, but a lot remains unclear. So we're putting your questions to VW and we'll have their answers live tonight. Have you thought about having laser eye surgery? It's a huge decision for anyone to make. Hayley Kent and Catherine Nicholas did just that and chose one of the country's leading clinics, Ultralays, because they offered lifetime care. Ultralays broke that promise, so we took up the case for Hayley and Catherine. And after we heard about people selling seriously ill dogs, we went undercover to buy a puppy who was in a terrible state. And the sad news is there were dozens more where he came from. Unsurprisingly, it's something the dealers didn't want anyone to know. Brace yourself for the most extreme rogue traders confrontation to date. There's nothing dirty about us. There's nothing dirty about us, John. You're the one that needs cleaning up. Unbelievable, you're right. Luckily, it was bath night, so that's <laughs> just as well. But it was all worth it because have a look at these. These are the lucky ones oh. that have oh. made it. Oh. Terrific. Plenty more on that later. Plus, gas and electricity smart meters. The government wants all of us to have them, but some of you have been in touch already to say they're not working, and what's more, they're costing you money. And, of course, a big welcome to the show to you, Sophie. Thank you nice very much. You. Lovely to be part of the team. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're talking child safety first up tonight. Let's face facts. Fitting a car seat isn't an easy job, so some retailers offer professional advice to parents. But over the last couple of months, we've been undercover investigating how some of the biggest names on the high street have no idea what they're doing. And we found failures right across the industry. So, if you think your child is safe just because their car seat was fitted for you, think again. This. Is my little boy George and as a parent a new parent you're really nervous about everything are they getting enough sleep are they eating the right things yeah. and of course about how to bring them up and most important of all you want to make sure they're safe at all times hands in George which is why when it comes to car seats it's crucial that they're fitted properly in the first place and why so many of us buy our seats from a trusted store and ask staff to show us how to fit them. Because they're the experts, right? The people trained to fit your seat properly, to give you the peace of mind that your child is as safe as they possibly could be. Or so you'd expect. But we've discovered that some of those people that we trust the most to fit our seats properly are systematically getting it wrong. And not just slightly wrong, dangerously wrong. We sent undercover researchers into five of the UK's biggest high street retailers to test out their fitting services. John Lewis, Halfords, Toys R Us, Smiths and Mothercare. In total, we went to 50 stores across the country, visiting 10 branches of each retailer, all under the watchful eyes of Julie Dagnall and Claire Waterhouse from Child Seat Safety, experts in car seat fitting. For each retailer, we bought their basic, own brand car seat and asked to use their advertised fitting service. Is someone around to show me how it fits in the car? Um, yeah. It's a job they should be comfortable with, considering they all promised to show how to fit the seat safely and by trained staff. Yeah, I should be able to get that fitted for you. All the seats we bought passed crash tests when fitted correctly, so staff need to be following the instructions for each seat exactly. 
it's tested to be fitted as per the manufacturer's instructions. And that's how they pass the standard with it. That's how it's crash tested. If you do it differently, we don't know how it's going to react. And it soon became clear many members of staff weren't entirely sure where to start. Oh, this is a puzzle one. <laughs> This bit here, I'm not sure what to do. Okay. Do you know okay. what? I'm not, um, I'm not so sure now. And some missed crucial questions. 19 of the 50 stores across the retailers didn't even ask us about the age or weight of the child, something they should all be doing before a seat fitting. And once they got started, the mistakes came in thick and fast. These red guides are used to hold the shoulder straps safely in place, but these Halford stores told us it was to keep the harness out of the way. And then what you can do is when you put the child in, you can hook this each side, put the child in. These one are just when you put in, uh, in the seat. Both completely wrong. One even told us that using them the correct way makes the seat less secure. A lot of parents use them for, yeah. for using the seat belts for them, and that's why the seat moves. Those red guides show you where to route the seat belt correctly, so they need to be followed. They're there to make sure in a collision it's going to react as it should do and keep the child safe. Another essential part of fitting a seat is to make sure it's as tight as possible to the car. Keeping the car's headrest in can push the seat forward in some models, creating a gap. But 20 stores out of 50 across the retailers didn't actually tell us to remove the headrest when fitting the seat. The result? huge gaps between the vehicle and the car seat. It's dangerous because you've not got good contact between the back of the child seat and the vehicle itself. It also means you've not got that seat belt as tight as you possibly can. So removing the headrest will mean that the seat will fit much tighter. That is going to come forward with quite some force. Now, even that small amount of gap is going to mean that the child could travel further forward than necessary. Another way of ensuring the seat is as tight as possible is to remove any slack from the seat belt. But some staff members try to tell us it's not supposed to be tight. The seat's got a bit of movement, but not normally with the seat, it does have that movement. With that seat, that's how it's designed, it moves a bit. OK. And then a little bit of movement's fine, because if there's no movement, it could cause more damage than good. I can't believe they've let them drive away like that. Obviously, the seat needs to be as tightly fitted as possible. That's going to be quite loose. There's going to be a lot of movement in it. It's going to obviously cause the seat to react very badly in a collision. Um, it's just frightening. Throughout our visits, we saw a catalogue of errors, from smaller problems with belt twists to much more serious risks. And remember, this is from staff members who are supposedly trained to fit these seats safely. One particularly worrying fitting was shown to us by Smiths, who simply placed the belt loosely over the seat and told us this was secure enough. Like that, and then it's not moving. <laughs> Only if it's tiny, but you can't help that. <sighs> I'm tempted to laugh, but I'm so frightened with the repercussions, you can't laugh, can you? It angers me that, that he thinks that that's OK and that he'll send somebody away and let somebody's child sit in it. Um, I wouldn't want my children sitting in that by any stretch of the imagination. But by far the most serious mistakes were from stores that failed to securely fit all parts of the seat to the car. This Toys R Us store only secured the bottom of the seat, meaning there's nothing stopping the top coming forward in a collision. However, the worst examples we came across were from John Lewis and Mothercare, who put the belt in entirely the wrong place. Instead of securing the seat at the top and the bottom, they simply fed the belt through the back of the seat, only securing it in the middle. Depending on what sort of collision you'd have, you could either have the whole seat tipping forward because you've only got one strength point there, or it could go underneath and the child could slide underneath with the seat. Um, so, who could say what sort of collision is going to occur, but in, in either case, something serious is going to happen. So, why are so many getting it wrong? Perhaps this John Lewis colleague has given us a clue. The food and drug at car seat um, suppliers, they come in and train us. And this is our own mate. You would have thought somebody would come in to say, yeah, this is Hayley, your own mate. 
Yes. Well, at the end of our visits across the country, only one store out of 50, a John Lewis branch, got the fitting right. That's an astonishing 98% that failed to fit our seats correctly. It's really worrying and upsetting that no parents are going to these people to get what they class as expert advice. They're being given the wrong advice, the seats are being fitted wrongly. There's no excuse. We're putting our prized possessions, our children, in other people's hands. And we've clearly seen here that people don't know what they're doing. That is really shocking. So 98% of the stores we went to got it wrong. And if you don't fit these seats properly, you cannot guarantee your child is safe. Well, that is the point. You can't guarantee they're safe. So this is how a correctly fitted seat would react in a crash. It's still pretty frightening. Uh, you'll see there is some movement, but the seat has done the job of protecting the child. So that's the seat that's being fitted yeah. correctly. I cannot begin to imagine what would happen if the seat hadn't been fitted properly. Yeah, that's, that's why I went down to the Transport Research Lab in Berkshire to test it out. Remember, and I must stress this, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the seats themselves. With the help of crash test engineer Tanya Robinson, we recreated and tested the worst fittings from our five retailers as judged by our experts to see how they'd react in a 30 mile an hour crash. Now, first up is this demonstration we were shown by Halfords. They'd only secured the seat in two points, so it twisted on impact. According to Tanya, the child's head would just stop short of the seat in front, but a slightly heavier child could well make an impact. Next up, it's Smith's. Now, this was the demonstration where the staff member loosely placed the belt across the seat, then told us it was secure. As the belt is higher than it should be, a greater force is applied to the neck and chest of the child. The force on the chest and the loading on the neck is about 30% higher than you might expect it. All because it's been connected too high and, and it's too loose. And too loose, yeah. Next, it's the demonstration from Toys R Us. They only secured the seat at the bottom and had nothing holding it in place at the top. Something flew off there, didn't it? Looks it like the headrest flew off. Oh, my goodness. Not only is there a risk of severe head injury from the impact with the seat in front, with no headrest in place, the child could also hit its head when it rebounds back to the seat. Now for the two most serious mistakes from our secret filming, where the seat was only secured in the middle. Recreating the John Lewis demonstration, this fitting means the base is able to move forward more than it should. What this seat's actually doing is sliding rather than absorbing the energy and the child is then being suddenly stopped and all the loading is going straight into the child. So that little dummy, poor little dummy, is taking quite a lot of pressure on its chest. So the higher the chest acceleration, the higher the risk of injury. The mother care fitting performed even worse, though, because as well as only securing the seat in the middle, they also failed to tighten the seat belt. And this was the result. Ooh. I mean, that is horrific. The child's now lying on its back. The seat base is almost hanging off the front of the bench. The obvious consequence of that is there's going to be some impact with the, with the seat in front by the legs, most probably. On top of this, the rebound could lead to severe impact to the head and neck. This is by far the most severe neck forces that we've seen. We also saw quite a large acceleration to the head, which can cause serious head injuries. And this wasn't a bad accident. This is only about 30 miles an hour. And the seat is useless because it just hasn't been fitted properly. It is. This is one of the worst tests that I've seen. And that's really down to the incorrect installation. Well, I'm sure you'll all be relieved to know that all five retailers said they would review staff training or processes. Now, John Lewis is carrying out a full independent review and complete staff retraining program. Uh, Mothercare is also reviewing training across its stores and says all of its car seat fittings will be signed off by a trained staff member with immediate effect. Now, Toys R Us are reviewing training and say as well as the demonstrations, they offer advice to customers when they first buy the seat. And Halford said it was confident in training but would review processes. And Smith says it's putting additional focus on staff training for car seats. Now, the best advice, pretty obvious, but if you have any concerns about the way your child's car seat is fit, is to go to the manual and follow the instructions very carefully. I, for one, have done just that, and I realised that I hadn't actually done poor old George's straps tight enough in his car seat. So I'm going to change that next week. Coming up...
Volkswagen answers your questions and meet Sue Fink. She was watching television one day, saw an advert that didn't seem quite right. Now it's been banned. We'll explain why. Now, some stories that we deal with on Rogue Traders are all about the money, and that's it. But some of them aren't. They're about something much more important. And tonight is one of those. There has been a great deal written on the subject of dogs and the unique nature of our relationship with them. It may be nonsense, but one theory is that we feel so strongly about dogs because they represent what we would like to see in ourselves. A simpler, more loyal, trusting and optimistic version of what's in the mirror. Now, as I say, it may be nonsense, but it does explain why when we find out that someone's causing harm to dogs, we tend to take it rather personally, you know, as a nation. I can't take you on this one, I'm afraid. I think it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride. Come on, let's go see Mama. Let's go see Mama. Yeah, that went well. That went well. A bumpy ride indeed. There's nothing dirty about us, John. Wet, dangerous and taking us to places dogs just shouldn't be. We're on the trail of puppy dealers John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny in West Yorkshire. They sell sick dogs purely for profit to people who love animals. People like Jane. She found an advert for a Shih Tzu puppy back in June. It said the puppy had been lovingly reared in a family home. She called up Bernadette and arranged to see the puppy. So what happened when you went there? What did you find? We were shown into the stable yard and in front of us were six Shih Tzu puppies just in a wheelbarrow on straw. One of them in particular didn't look particularly well. Um, and I actually raised the point, the guy at the stable yard, he reassured me that actually they, these puppies were absolutely fine. Um, they'd all been vet checked. To me, there was something wrong with that situation and those puppies. I backtracked and said, I'm not comfortable, I'm not sure about this. The guy at the stable yard was getting impatient. Jane felt pressured to make a decision on the spot, so she paid £350 and took the puppy, who she named Leia, with her. But even on the way home, it was obvious she wasn't well. In the journey, that dog was horrendously ill. She was slavering from her mouth. She was vomiting. So I said to my partner, I want to get her vet checked straight away. Leia was diagnosed with severe diarrhoea, malnourishment and a flea infestation. And just four days after she was bought, she died. You think you're going to get a new addition to your family, a beautiful, healthy, bouncing puppy. The impact they have, they come into your life and it's as if they've been there forever, not just for a few days. You know, it was devastating, devastating to find a, a puppy dead in its bed, in your lounge. Jane's vet told her to call the puppy seller to explain what had happened. And what response did you get? Abuse down the phone. I was told that that puppy was absolutely fine and there was nothing wrong with it, and he slammed the phone down on me. It's difficult to say. Do you regret having bought the puppy you did? No. I want to stop them doing what they're doing. And so do we. So I suppose the message of this is never to buy a dog from a place that you have suspicions about. Guess what we're going to do now, you two? That's right. We're going to buy a dog from a place about which we have suspicions. I'm well aware of the paradox. You paradox. <laughs> We're replying to this advert selling Shih Tzu Bichon Freeze Cross puppies. John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny have advertised a new litter for sale. So, we make the call. Hello. Hello, is this puppy seller? Yeah, it is, yeah. We arrange a visit to meet a woman who calls herself Louise and, of course, the dog. The investigation is on. First, a very important question. Yes. So, we need a name for this dog. What do you think, Vladimir? How about that, Vladimir? <laughs> Well, how about Gareth? No. Yes? Well, those are my top two. You come up with something. 
is it? What is it? What is it? Gizmo. That sounds all right. Hiya. Gizmo it is. And the appointment has been made, but that's not where our planning ends. Because we're going undercover with expert witness vet Mike Jessup. If our doggy isn't 100%, Mike can tell us straight away. Here to greet us is Louise. Except that's not her actual name, because we know she's Bernadette Nunny. Do you want to hold this? Yeah. Give it a go. Oh, Kimball, being safe. He's a little bit well, nervous. We don't believe in keeping him in cages at all. No. You know, um, I'm claustrophobic, so I know what it feels to be. It's best to let him out, isn't it? How old are you? The 14 weeks now. Oh, right, yeah. okay. Nice. Yeah. But they're a good age now. Yeah. Because when they're too young, it's not fair. No. So far, so caring. But her name isn't the only lie she tells us. Do you have lots of puppies? No. No, oh, right. no this is Is it, it last of them? Is it? it? Oh, right, OK. No, this is her first litter. She's not having any more. Oh, right, OK. I've got dogs, but got, we haven't got time for puppies. Really? Because in the last month, we've seen four different adverts for four different breeds, advertised by Bernadette Nunny and John Wilcock. And he'll, he'll be uh, all right around kids and stuff, won't Oh, he? definitely, so yeah. we've got our niece come yeah. around quite a bit. Oh, definitely, yeah. Now, this bit is really important. When you're buying a puppy, make sure that you see it with its mum. It's one way of being sure that the pup hasn't been bred elsewhere and brought in. And please, don't accept excuses. Are the mum and dad around? Uh, she's, she is somewhere. I don't know where she is. I'm roaming about. Free range. <laughs> yeah. We've got, like, 90-odd acres, so she could be oh, anywhere. Oh, she could be anywhere on it. Oh, gosh, yeah. Excuses like that one. I think he's really nice. Yeah. Oh, dear. I know. Strange, isn't it? Here. <laughs> he will do. For tonight, he'll probably just, like, lay in a corner and think, where the hell are Oh, is he right? We pay £275 for Gizmo. Yeah. So, That's, so is, is, is if that... If you need us, bro, just yeah. give us a ring. Oh, right, OK, Good. then. But this situation is all wrong. Bernadette asks no questions about us, and she's given us no paperwork. Just a bag of mouldy food that Mike says would make Gizmo sick if we gave it to him. Alrighty. What's most worrying is that Gizmo is most definitely not OK. He's shockingly underweight. You can feel... His, his spine is standing up, and his little ribs, you can rattle those ribs. He just looks to me like he's terrified of life. Well, Gizmo's now in the best place he could possibly be, but dogs in distress at a rural address. I'm sure it's not something you'd want us to sit back and ignore. More in ten. Well, as always, we'd like to hear your tip-offs. If you have a story for us, get in touch because these guys are waiting for you. Email us at watchdog at bbc.co.uk or go to the website and click where it says send us your stories. Now, the details will be on the screen throughout the show. Nice T-shirts from our gang. We saved up and bought them for them. Can I introduce you to one man who hasn't got a T-shirt? This is the editor of Auto Express. His name is Steve Fowler. Good morning to you, sir. Or good evening, I should say. Good to evening. You. How are you, right? Oh, good, thanks. He's yeah. going to be a busy man because he's going to be conducting a live chat on Twitter throughout the show and for 30 minutes afterwards. He's attempting to answer all your questions about the Volkswagen emission scandal. Tweet your questions using the hashtag AskWatchdog and he'll answer as many as he can. Please don't send us complaints to that hashtag, but use the email or website instead. And we'll hear some of those later. And we've got answers directly, remember, from VW from some of your questions. Now, electricity and gas smart meters. The government wants every household to have one by 2020. In a few minutes, I'm going to be talking to the man responsible for selling the idea to all of us. Well, you might want to ask him why we've had over 100 complaints saying they don't work, regardless of the size of the house. And may I say, Sophie, I love what you've done with the place. Thank you. Deny it as much as you like, but autumn is here and the chill wind of the British winter will soon be upon us. Which means, if it isn't already, the heating will be going on. Tea, please, Lambert. It is freezing out there. Over the years, the way we keep an eye on our energy use has changed dramatically, but the biggest development of all is about to come. 
A hundred years ago, it was pretty straightforward. You just got your staff to count how many logs you'd burned or how much coal you'd thrown on your fire or range. And if you did have electricity, rudimentary meters were being developed. It started with the electrolytic, then the pendulum meter in the late 1800s. After that, induction meters like this one from the 1960s that most of us will recognize. Known as dumb meters, they simply record energy use over a fixed period. You take a manual reading and your bill is crudely estimated between those readings. But that is where smart meters like this are supposed to change the game, giving you the power to see exactly how much energy you're using and, crucially, how much it's costing you. Um, where's that tea? More than 1.3 million of them have so far been installed across the UK, but are they actually doing their job? Scores of you have been in touch to tell us that your new intelligent meters are anything but. So we asked you to point your smartphones at your smart meters and show us. Fire up the magic lantern. Some of you couldn't get your smart meter to work with your solar panels, like Kevin from Cornwall. Andy from Suffolk couldn't get accurate readings and his meter quickly turned into a dumb meter. They worked fine for a while. When they went wrong, I then had to submit monthly readings. They eventually changed the electric meter, but I have to send in the gas meter reading. If I have to submit one reading, I might as well submit both of them. As for Owen, a landlord from the West Midlands, he fitted several smart meters to his properties. Four years later, none of them are working, meaning months of inaccurate bills. Do they save you time and effort? No. I've had three or four years of torment. Do smart meters save you money? No, they're not smart at all. With one in ten smart meters not working properly, the problems are so widespread that MPs on the Energy and Climate Change Select Committee have warned that without significant improvements, the £11 billion rollout risks becoming a costly failure. So will the government and the energy companies finally get our smart meters to do their job? Or is getting a meter that works more down to simple luck? than smart technology, yes? Madam, the heating bill. Well, he seems happy, unlike some of our viewers. Sasha Deshmukh from Smart Energy GB joins me now. £11 billion this is costing, is it worth it? Well, what we've got to remember is this is the biggest modernisation of our energy system that we've seen for a generation, and it's really happening for two reasons. We've got to, as energy consumers, get a much better service for the energy that we all buy, get rid of estimated bills, get tools that help, can help us reduce the amount of energy we use, but also as a country, we really need to have a modern energy system. We've got to do it, but one in ten of these meters, these smart meters that's supposed to be revolutionizing it, just simply aren't working. We had one landlord there saying it's given him years of torment. So Populous, a research company, has actually talked to smart meter users and found that overwhelmingly they're saying their smart meters are not only working, but they're transforming the way they buy gas and electricity. They can see what they're buying in pounds and pence. They are recommending smart meters to their friends and family. There so... are teething problems, though, aren't there? And one of the big problems seems to be that you cannot switch... If you switch a supplier, it doesn't necessarily mean that your smart meter will work with that other supplier. And we're always being told to save money by switching suppliers. You get caught. So smart meters are definitely being designed so that you can switch more easily. They help you switch more quickly. They'll help you switch more reliably. They'll give you the they information work, to switch. They do they? Actually, most energy suppliers, can, if you've got a smart meter, they can switch you and they can make sure you get all of your smart services. Some energy suppliers are being a little bit slower at providing all of those services. But don't worry, if you've got a smart meter and you do switch to them, even if they can't give it to you right now, they will be doing it and it will happen automatically over the air. My recommendation to any viewer who's got a smart meter and they want to switch is ask the company you want to switch to whether you can keep all of your smart services. But even if they say you can't, don't worry, because you are going to get them, whoever your energy supplier is, does, and they'll do that very soon. It does sound like, actually, maybe people should just wait until the actual technology catches up with what you're trying to do. I wouldn't really say anyone should wait. The main reason being, it's so difficult when you're spending, the average person, about £1,400 a year on energy, and you can't see what you're spending in pounds and pence, and you can't really plan. And a smart meter automatically makes you able to do that and really does help with accuracy. So I'd recommend that people do get them. And you've got one, have you? Uh, do you know, 
like lots of people, I'm trying to upgrade at the moment. You haven't got one? My, I've asked my energy company to upgrade me, but they're two million metres already, but they're 50 million to do. You're and the I man can't rolling this line. out. You're the man selling it to us. I thought it wouldn't be right for me to jump the line either, but I'm lucky enough to have talked to people who've got How them. long is the line? Well, 50 million <laughs> metres to do, so it's going to take a long, uh, over the next five years for us to actually upgrade every home in the country. But it's one of the biggest programmes that's ever happened of this type. Right, well, good luck getting your metre, Sasha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Still to come, after paying thousands for laser eye surgery and a promise of lifetime care, the worst thing happens. Your eyesight deteriorates and the company refuses to honour your guarantee. Really? Not on our watch. Back to tonight's rogues, John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny. They're selling sick and dying dogs over the internet using adverts which make out they come from a family home. That's what the ad for our new rogue traders mascot, Gizmo, said. And yet he turned up shockingly underweight and terrified of humans. Let's see how he's getting on. Alrighty. Well, Gizmo is seriously unwell. He's malnourished and significantly older than we were told. His fur is stained yellow, which is a sign he slept in his own urine. He's not been vaccinated and has a potentially lethal parasite called Giardia. His demeanour is very, very flat, and he just looks to me like he's terrified of life at the moment. And I think that's probably because he's been so badly confined. Of course, that's not what Bernadette told us. She said something completely different. We don't believe in keeping him in cages at all. The socialisation side is really what concerns me most of all with him. He doesn't seem to know how to interact with people. That's going to be a real problem for him in, for the rest of his life. Oh. Oh. Okay, He's in danger of being a little bit of an aggressive dog. And therefore, he shouldn't go into an environment with kids uh, because kids will want to go up and cuddle him and his reaction will be to try and bite. Um, He'd be all right around kids and stuff. Oh, it? definitely, so yeah. we've got our knees coming yeah. out quite a bit. Oh, definitely, yeah. He never wags his tail. He cowers in the corner, he's withdrawn, and he's scared. But he's still our dog. So we're going to get some specialist help for him. Meet dog behaviourist Carrie Evans. First impressions when he came into the room, very, very timid. Didn't want to explore his environment. Every time we've picked him up, he's sort of scrambled to try and get away clearly indicates, because of his lack of engagement with human beings, that he hasn't had any attention, which is quite sad. Just like Mike, Carrie suspects he's been kept in a cage for his whole life. She's decided to keep him for the next few weeks to try and socialise him. Meanwhile, we call back John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny, or, as she's known to us, Louise, to let them know how sick Gizmo is. Hello. Hello. Is Louise there, please? Hi Is Louise there, please? Uh, she's not available at the moment, I'm speaking. It's uh, Chris. Called a couple of days ago regarding the puppy I bought. Right, and what's happened with pup? Well, it's the same, same as last time, so we, I told you we got the test results back from the vet and it had parasites, contagious parasites. Right. It doesn't come near us, doesn't come near the kids. I was just a bit worried about her. I was wondering if she could tell me a little bit more about him. She knew, she obviously, she knows about him because she had the litter and stuff like that. Yeah, alright. Okay. Right. Alright, cheers, James. Unsurprisingly, we never hear back. That's possibly because John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny have been very busy. This is what's confusing me. You see, the day we bought Gizmo, they said he was the very last puppy they had. And yet, the day after we bought him, they put another advert online offering Shih Tzu Bichon Freeze Cross Puppies for sale. You make sense of that? I don't get it. Do you get it? In fact, we've linked John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny to nine different litters, nearly 50 puppies in the last four months. They use five different telephone numbers. And here's the clincher. The pictures they use in their adverts aren't the dogs they're trying to sell to you. When two more team members go in posing as customers, suddenly, John Wilcock is answering calls again. Oh, hi, guys. Oh, they're a bit scared. Uh, is it normal for them to be a bit sort of nervy around strangers? Yeah, they are strangers. Yeah, they like kids, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's like they're coming out of the shell a bit more now. 
you get down to their level, then... If you don't name them, that's when they get too attached to me. So I don't get attached to them. <laughs> We're probably not in a position to take one or anything today, but, you know, we don't want but, to miss out. Um, well, I've got somebody else wanting to come, so... Oh, have you? Yeah. Do, do they want one or two? I'm not bothered. I don't know. Oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah, not bothered. That's about right. But they should be, because John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny are breaking the law. And if you're prepared to sit still, I'll tell you why. You might be thinking to yourself, well, don't they need a licence for this sort of thing? And it's a very good point well made. If they're breeding more than four litters a year on the premises, they should have a breeder's licence issued by the local authority. But if they're just, as we suspect, bringing the same volume of dogs onto the premises to sell, well, then they need a pet shop licence. Now, I need to take my footage to someone who understands exactly what's going on in your heads. And that someone is pet behaviourist Carrie Evans. Whoa, look at that. Absolutely terrified. They want to run to that point of safety. These puppies feel safe when they're in the cage. Look at the tails down. Exactly the same as Gizmo, terrified of people that should be with them on a daily basis, playing with them, feeding them. Behaviour to one side, we were told that Gizmo was the last for litter and that's it, they don't do, they don't, you know, sell a lot of dogs. Gizmo isn't a Cocker Spaniel, Gizmo is nothing like a Cocker Spaniel, he's a Shih Tzu cross. So where have these come from? This is a multi-breed operation, it's purely for money. People don't, people who love dogs do not treat dogs like that. So how is Gizmo doing? He was really scared around people. Time to see the results of Carrie's hard work. We saw a huge contrast when we introduced Sophie. Another dog in the room. Wanted to play straight away, wanted to engage. And that actually relaxed him around the people. So that would indicate that he's been around other dogs up until this age, to the detriment that he doesn't want to engage and relate to people. She's been working round the clock to socialise him. I can't wait to meet him again. Meet Gizmo. Oh, hello, Gizmo. Good boy. Well done. So you're coming on really nicely. He's going to be fine, isn't he? With with time. Yeah, yeah. we'll get there. Have a little cuddle. Oh, Gizmo, don't worry, mate. Don't worry, mate. He's going to be all right. God, he's super cute, isn't he? He's lovely. But as we're going to find out, Gizmo has been the lucky one. OK, well... You know what's coming next. I'm afraid, unlike you, it's not going to be pretty, but we've got to do it. We've got to do it for Gizmo, for Leia, and anyone that's ever loved a dog. Away you go. <laughs> it's time to go. OK, so we know that all is not well behind those gates, but what can you do to avoid being part of this terrible trade? First, and most important, always see the dog with its mum where it was reared. Any excuses for mum's absence, just walk away. Number two, never impulse buy. You should visit a number of times where the breeder asks as many questions as you do. If you're pressured to buy however you've travelled, however far you've travelled, just walk away. And three, puppies like people. If they're scared of you, don't buy them to rescue them. Your money could end up buying four or five more to take their place. All of that advice and plenty more is on our website. Next, laser eye surgery. No more glasses or contact lenses. That's what it promises. It costs thousands and it is, of course, a very big decision. Yeah, usually very safe, but there are some risks associated with the procedure and there's always a chance that you might need further treatment, even years after the operation. And that's why many people chose a company that guaranteed them a lifetime of free aftercare, Ultralase. Lifetime guarantee, really? Well, Michelle Ackley's been investigating. For the more than 100,000 people a year who opt for laser eye surgery, the need for glasses can magically disappear overnight. Or in science speak, the procedure works by reshaping the cornea. That's the clear layer at the front of the eye, which when out of shape can cause blurry vision. The first company in the UK to offer this state-of-the-art treatment was Ultralase. Launched in 1991, within 20 years, its nationwide clinics had treated nearly 200,000 people. Ultralase made one very special promise to its customers, a lifetime care guarantee. And that guarantee was pretty important to them. 
You see, over time, your eyes can change and follow-up surgery may be needed. So to reassure patients, Ultralays promise to provide unlimited free aftercare. And it was that promise and peace of mind that persuaded Hayley Kent to choose Ultralays for her laser eye surgery in 2011. At the time, her short-sightedness was so bad that she needed glasses from the moment she woke up to the moment she went to bed. The lifetime guarantee to me made me feel that they would care for me for the rest of my life and that I wouldn't have to then a few years later be going out and paying for glasses. Haley took the plunge and spent £3,990 on laser eye surgery. Initially, the treatment was a success. However, the following year, Haley noticed her vision was starting to deteriorate. I was doing my driving test and I noticed that I needed the glasses to do the, my driving lessons. And those problems began around the same time that Ultralase was having problems of its own. After running into money troubles, the company was eventually bought by Russell Ambrose in 2012, who also owned a rival laser eye giant called Optimax. He promised that the Ultralay's lifetime care guarantee would continue to be valid. Great news for Haley's blurry vision. She visited Ultralay's, who tested her eyes and confirmed her worst fears that she would need further treatment. But she'd have to wait six months for her prescription to stabilize. So she did, confident in the promise that her guarantee remained valid under the company's new owners. But when she called Ultralase to make a new appointment, she was told that they were now in administration and Haley was in for a nasty surprise. Ultralase sent Haley a letter confirming that as the company was now in administration and no longer trading, Haley's lifetime guarantee wasn't worth the paper it was written on. I just feel really let down that I was it was advertised that I would be glasses free for the rest of my life and it's not something that's happened. I now have to wear glasses for driving. Haley has since had to pay out for glasses and is still waiting for follow-up treatment. Her rejection letter was crystal clear that Ultralase had stopped trading. But then, the very same day, she received a strong clue that the company was in fact still very active. On the day that I received a letter from Ultralays advising that they'd gone into administration, I also received another letter from them asking me to recommend their service to a friend. Confused? You're not the only one. How can a company stop trading and cancel its guarantees, yet still seem to be active and advertising for new customers? To answer that, I think we need a masterclass in company takeovers and broken promises. Step one, when you see your trusted competitor go up for sale, snap them up. Step two, wait around for a year. Step three, put the company into administration. Take what you want, in this case, the trusted Ultralay's brand name, but leave behind the lifetime guarantee and the costs that go with it. Step four, this is really important, especially if you're keeping the brand, you must remember to change the limited company name. So goodbye to the old Ultralays Limited and hello to the new Ultralays Eye Clinics Limited, which is legally a new different entity. This means the company that made the promises technically no longer exists and neither do the lifetime guarantees, but the new company can keep operating with the same brand name, same logo, same website. Genius! But as clever as that master plan is, there is one potential flaw. Angry customers and bad publicity. So in 2014, Russell Ambrose had a change of heart and promised that lifetime guarantees would once again be valid. Well, since that new promise, it seems that some customers have now been given the free eye care they were guaranteed. But it's not been so simple for others. Like Catherine Nicholas, she paid the old Ultralays £3,890 for laser eye surgery in 2008 to correct her long and short-sightedness. However, in March this year, she noticed that her vision was deteriorating. A worried Catherine phoned the all-new Ultralays, who initially said that, as per their promise, she would be covered. Her relief didn't last long, though. They said that the powers that be in the company had decided to charge for eye. I was a bit taken aback at this, as I expected, to, if I needed further treatment, for it to be free. But that wasn't going to stop Catherine. She then went to her local Ultralays branch, who for a second time told her she'd have to pay for treatment. I feel angry. 
I feel angry and let down. Um, I'm very disappointed. Disappointed that they are not honouring an agreement that was made when I had my eyes lasered. So after all the promises from the old and new ultralays, what exactly are customers being told now? We wanted to test it out for ourselves, so we made three calls to head office, posing as relatives of customers who wanted to check their lifetime guarantees. Now, he has a lifetime guarantee, so he was wondering whether that meant he would get it for free. Does he get this for free? Because I know he's got a lifetime guarantee. And guess what? During every one of our three calls, the message was crystal clear. So he's like, lifetime guarantees, not valid. Void, OK. On all the calls, we were very clearly told that the lifetime guarantee was no longer valid. So after years of broken promises, will Ultralays finally start giving all their customers the free care they were guaranteed? Well, Ultralay says it continues to honour guarantees to past patients and will do so in future, provided they have stuck to their terms and conditions. The company accepts that its call centre gave us the wrong advice about the aftercare guarantee and, in light of our investigation, they will review call centre staff training and call monitoring. And good news for Catherine and Haley. Ultralays says it will pay for any further treatment. Chris. Thanks. OK, the Volkswagen Group emissions scandal now. 1.2 million vehicles affected, not just Volkswagen, of course, but also Seat, Skoda and Audi. Now, we've heard from VW that all the vehicles will be recalled by the end of 2016. We know lots of you out there are affected and still have questions that need answering. Now, we went to the company itself to specifically answer some of our watchdog viewers' questions. Now, this is Neil Hodson. He owns a Skoda. He's a bit confused because when he put his vehicle identification number into the Volkswagen website, it said that it wasn't affected. But when he used the Skoda website, it said it was. Now, we put that to VW. They told us we ask customers to visit their own brand's website. So a Skoda owner goes to the Skoda website, a Seat owner to the Seat website, and so on. Now, this is Matthew Lakin. Now, he's a VW owner, and he asked us if his road tax goes up, will he have to pay for it? Well, VW told us that the British government has already said that road tax won't go up for people in Matthew's situation. And this is Lee Cripps. He's also been in touch. He owns an Audi Q3, which is affected by the scandal. He paid a premium for the car's higher performance. He's now worried that when his car is updated, it'll lower the power. I'm afraid, Lee, there's no answer to that, I'm afraid. VW said they can't comment until the specifics of the service procedures are clarified. Well, I hope that has helped some of you. You remember Steve, the editor of Auto Express, has been answering questions on Twitter. Quite a few people have been in touch, haven't they? We've, we've had hundreds and hundreds of people so far. Yeah, and I bet they're not been all VW owners. No, a lot of people have been asking if other manufacturers have been involved. The government has actually confirmed that no other manufacturers are involved, but still they've called the industry representatives and VW representatives to appear in front of them on Monday in front of the Transport Select Committee. So we may get more answers then. OK, hope we do. And you're around for another 30 minutes, right? I'll be here, yeah. OK, brilliant. Don't forget, he'll be answering your questions for the rest of the show and afterwards. Send them to us using the hashtag... Ask Watchdog. Remember, he can't comment on specific issues, so please don't mention individual company names. If you want us to investigate a particular company, then email us at watchdog at bbc.co.uk or go to our website. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to everyone who has been in touch about that story. Now, here are a few more for you. Earlier in the year, Mad Men's famous redhead Christina Hendricks underwent a dramatic change to advertise Clairol's nice and easy hair dye. Goodbye, Red. Hello, golden blonde. But it was not all as it seemed. Sue Fink, watching at home, complained the colour change wasn't possible using that product alone. The Advertising Standards Authority investigated and it turned out Christina's hair had been dyed in a different sequence from the ad. You see, she'd actually gone from blonde to red, but the ad suggested it was the other way around. Well, makers Procter & Gamble said that the colour change was possible and submitted before and after photos as well as signed statements from the star and colourist. But the ASA ruled that their claims were exaggerated and unsubstantiated and banned the ad for being misleading. So it just goes to show that one person really can make a difference.
Now, you know, the worst part of that story is she's not really a redhead. She, I'm sorry to break That's that to disaster. you. disaster. She's blonde. Are you a fan of the KFC Crush'em? What are they? That is a cup of milky goodness filled to the brim, if you are to believe this advert. Ooh, that does look good. Or so thought Karen Aitken from Hampshire. But when she bought one, she found it substantially less full than the one in the advert. And furthermore, there's actually a line printed on every cup as a guide for servers. It looks as though someone's already had a bit of a go at it. Now, Karen clearly felt crushed. Chris, how on earth can KFC justify this? It's like ordering a Matt all right and getting a Chris Hollins, half size. <laughs> well, they told us the line is there to leave room so toppings and sauces can be blended without overflowing. They also admitted that full cups are used in promotional materials so that the product looks the best it can. And said that if a customer is disappointed, staff will be happy to help. Well, if you've experienced a similar food fib, then do get in touch. Email us at watchdog at bbc.co.uk or go to our website. Now, back to our puppy dealers. John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny are selling puppies, bringing them plenty of money, but also bringing misery to the dogs and the families who buy them. And that just won't do. We're on our way to confront John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny, but we're not the only ones on their tail. Just five days before we arrive, we discover the RSPCA have raided the farm. They rescued over 40 dogs, of which a number were already dead, and one was found dying in a wheelbarrow. We hope there are no more dogs. We hope they are now safely in the hands of the RSPCA, but we hope there are people, people that we want to talk to, ask some questions of. We park up outside, and we're ready. Timing's just right. Hello there. Because that's John Wilcock in the courtyard. John, Matt Allwright from BBC Rogue Traders. How are you? What I'd like to ask you is how can you own a dog yourself and yet still sell dogs in the condition that we bought Gizmo, our dog? How can you do that? How can you how can you own dogs yourself? How can you own dogs yourself and still keep that many, call them, please, call them here, any time you like. How can you sell dogs in that condition to people who take them home and within days they die, John? How can that be? Tell me, tell me how you can do that, yeah, consciously. Can you give me an explanation? Because there are dog owners across the country who want to understand it as well. This is Matt Allwright from right. BBC Rogue Traders asking you how you, in front of a nation full of dog lovers, can behave the way you do. You got an answer for me? Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know. Yes. Bernadette, can you tell me how you can have dogs around the farm and yet pull them out of a place around the back and then... Right, let's go and see what we can find around the back. Bring the police. Listen, guys, we'll be more than happy for you to bring the police. Bring anybody that... Yeah, cos we're off now. There's Bernadette in the corner there. So this was the operation. This was where you'd call to come and pick up your dog that you thought had been raised in a family home, but in fact was in a crate out the back or a yard in the back, and they were being kept, we think, 40 dogs at least. When the RSPCA came in here, they found dead dogs out the back. That's right, isn't it? That's right, isn't it, John? Dead dogs. Dogs that were being so poorly kept, you couldn't even keep them alive. You couldn't feed them properly, you couldn't keep them free from disease. I'm right, aren't I? John? Bernadette. OK. Right, well, while they're there, we can go and have a poke round the back and see what we can find. We head to where we think the dogs were being kept so we can see the conditions Gizmo was living in. But John Wilcock doesn't want us anywhere near there. Get out of this farm now. Sorry, John, you want us away from the farm? Get out of this farm now. OK, no, so tell me, now you're out, John, no. now that we're leaving, John, Tell me, how can you keep dogs in the conditions that we've seen them in? And then hand them out to people, and then hand them out. What are you doing with that? What are you doing with that? You're going to jet wash us. We're making for the exit, but John makes sure we're not leaving dry. Now! There's nothing dirty about us. Get out! There's nothing dirty about us, John. You're the one that needs cleaning up. It's only water, John, for Christ's sake. You need to clean... Things quickly take a more serious turn when a woman picks up a brick and throws it at our cameraman. Yeah! It 
bounces off the back of his camera and hits his neck. OK, time to go, time to go. We make a fast exit. You all right, mate? OK, close the door, please. Seat belts on, everyone. What hit you, Jamie? A rock. We call the police. So, as you can see, that's the welcome that we got. John Wilcock turned a uh, pressure washer on us. A woman we believe to be the landowner threw a brick, hit our cameraman. OK, time to go, time to go. We need to get Jamie properly looked at all, isn't it? But as we try to drive away, the exit road is being blocked by a van and two of John Wilcock's friends. Luckily, the police are close by. They quickly deal with the passenger who's starting towards us. Finally, we set off, but even then, the van still follows us. He's now following us as we try and leave this place. I don't know what's going to happen. He's by himself. He's got a, a white transit van. Eventually, he works that out and drives off. God forbid you ever go to that place. God forbid you ever come across those people it's searching for some kind of joy from a little doggy. Be very, very careful, please, guys, when you're responding to adverts for puppies, because you just don't know where you're going. You don't know who you're dealing with unless you ask some really good questions and make sure you get the right answers. That is what you're funding, unless you're doing your homework when you buy a dog. Please, I ask you, please don't do it. As we reported, when the RSPCA raided the place, they did sadly find some dead and dying animals. But have a look at this. Over 30 puppies now safe and well at one of their centres. We took them along some toys, the first they'd ever had. But it doesn't end there. We know there are other dishonest puppy dealers in the country, and we know that you might know where some of them are. Get in touch. Let us know. We also want to know how to solve the problem once and for all. Any suggestions, very welcome. But for now, these are the faces you need to remember. John Wilcock and Bernadette Nunny, our first rogues on the wall. Dogs everywhere. Lift your legs in salute. Brilliant stuff, Matt. Loads of you getting in touch. Thank you very much. Maria Fowler on the car seat story. Parents, please check your car seats. I can't believe how badly they've been fitted. A tweet here from Ahim Bapa. I'm glad I watched tonight. As I soon to be dad, I'll be fitting my child's seat. Well, keep sending us your stories and your tip-offs. Just go to our website and click where it says send your story. <coughs> you can write to us as well. The address is on your screens now. Next week, Animal Friends Pet Insurance. Lots of friendly faces on their website. Not so friendly when it comes to paying out. Sky TV, easy to sign up, almost impossible to leave. Why can't they take no for an answer? And do you want to know the best way to get yourself off cold calling? We'll tell you now. That's all next Thursday at 8 o'clock. Until then, goodbye. Coming up.